Okay, great. Now we're recording. Okay, so uh, what is G prime here, or how do we find it? One half times twenty five x squared plus two my negative one half. Times it, five. Times what? Times five. Not five. And X. 10x, yeah, the derivative of what's inside. So one thing I would just want to point out, because this is a common mistake people make when we're using the, you know, taking the derivative of parentheses to a power. When we bring the power down initially, right, we have that one half that we bring down in front and that goes here. Then what's inside the parentheses doesn't change, right? That's the same stuff. There's no change. It's only after when we're applying the chain rule that we multiply by the derivative. So sometimes people want to like do one half and then they'll put the 10 X in the parentheses to the negative one half. Cause we know we have to have the derivative of what's inside, but that doesn't come until the end. Um, and, uh, let's see. So the G prime that, that, uh, simplifies a little one half times 10 X is five X. We have five X times five X squared plus two to the negative one half. Okay. So now we're ready for the quotient rule. How does the quotient rule go? G times F prime plus F times G prime. Yeah, it's a minus, right? Um, all over, all over G squared. The, the we're subtracting when it's a quotient rule. We subtract the two and we divide the whole thing by G squared. If it's the product rule, that's when we're adding the two and when we don't divide by anything. Um, a couple of things on on the um, on the last quiz, I saw uh, a couple people like reverse these, right? So it, it starts out with G times F prime. Okay, so let's plug stuff in. Uh, G times F prime. So that's a negative six X times five X squared plus two to the one half minus F times G prime seven minus three X squared times five X, five X squared plus two to the negative one half all over G squared. If I square the square root, it just gets rid of the radical. So we have five X squared plus two. All right, so now comes the fun part, right? I mean, what we have written down here is equal to the derivative, but um, it is not very useful <laughs> form of the derivative. Um, I, if if we're thinking about problem three, right? And in part B, they say, oh, you know, we're going to find where the derivative is zero. I don't want to find where this is zero. Like, I don't want to do that with the derivative in this form. Um, how do we simplify? Take out the greatest con factor. Mm hmm and so what can we take out? 5x squared plus 2 to the negative 1 half. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think we can also take out an x. So I'll take that out too. Now what goes inside? Five x squared plus two times the negative six. Mm-hmm. And then we bring down right the minus here. And now uh, what comes next? Seven. Minus three x squared 
times five. Yeah. Good. Um, is everybody okay with this so far? Did everybody understand uh, why we have, have gotten to this point? Okay. Um, so, I guess now what we'll do is, uh, well, we could take this negative one half and throw it down in the bottom so we'll have um, 5x squared plus 2 to the positive three halves down there, right? Because that's going to combine with this that's already to the first power. And then we're going to have to distribute, you know, expand out the stuff in the brackets. Um, so this is negative 30x squared minus 12. And, okay, I'm going to be careful. i got to distribute the 5 and the negative, so that'll be a minus 35 plus 15x squared. And this is all over 5x squared plus 2 to the uh, 3 halves. And then combining like terms gives us... Uh, let's see, we have negative 15x squared um, and minus 35 minus 12 is minus 47. And if you like, you could, you know, to take out the negative if you like. I, I, I kind of like having positive terms in the parentheses if possible. If we think about, you know, part B when they said where is this equal to zero, you know, we have our derivative now, right, is this fraction. There's our dy dx. If I were interested in where this derivative is equal to zero, this is why we work so hard to simplify because um, I don't have to do much work to tell you that the only place where this derivative is zero is when x is zero. Um, first of all, a fraction is only zero when the numerator is, right? So if I have this equal to zero, that means that that negative x times 5x squared plus 47 is zero. And now we have a product set equal to zero, right? So that means that either x is zero or 5x squared plus 47, oh, whoops, that's a 15, 15x squared plus 47 is zero. Um, but 15x squared plus 47 is never zero, right? I mean, you square any x, it'll be non, it'll be non-negative, right? And then I'm going to add 47 to it, right? The, the smallest value that 15x squared plus 47 it, uh, attains is 47. So it's never going to be zero. This doesn't happen. And that's the only spot where this is zero. So this the same kind of technique, this approach should work in, in the actual function that you have in part A. Um, other questions? You go over number five. Yeah, is that the like train problem or something, or yeah. subway? Okay. Okay, so they tell us they give us a displacement function. S is forty t minus five t squared. And they ask us, how far does it travel in coming to a stop?
So like once once they start applying the brakes, that's when this displacement function takes over. And and they're applying the brakes to stop, so they want to know what is that total displacement that it that it has as it's coming to a stop. So I guess I guess one thing I'll I'll uh, point out is that if I knew when it stopped, if I knew how long it takes to stop, we'd be done, right? If I if somebody said, "Oh, it stops after 15 seconds," all I do is plug in 15 for t and I get a displacement. So maybe we could identify that as our intermediate goal. Like, let's find when it stops. And then we'll evaluate S at that value at, at that value of T. So I don't know the displacement when it stops. That's obviously our goal. But um, I do know the velocity when it stops, right? What is the velocity after it comes to a stop? Zero. Zero. The velocity will be zero. How is velocity related to displacement? So like this displacement um, has units of feet. A velocity, what, what would the units of velocity be? Feet per second, right? It's a rate. It's a rate of change of displacement. So how is velocity related to displacement in a calculus way? It's a rate of change, and, and in calculus, we give that a name. The derivative? Yeah, yeah. So the velocity is the derivative of displacement with respect to time. So what you want to do is, in order to find when it stops, kind of elaborate on these steps, let's find the velocity, which is ds dt. And you can, you know, you don't have to use the limit definition. Sometimes people default to just using the limit definition on this problem for some reason, but feel free to use just the, our rules for finding derivatives. Find the velocity function, which is the derivative. We want to find when it stops, so what do I do with that? Okay. Uh. That velocity equals to zero. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, you will have found when it stops. And then you're ready to uh, evaluate. Plug that value of t into s. How's that? Pretty great. Um, any other questions? I don't think we've had any questions on, on one or four. Are those problems going OK? Or we just do we just find the, the, the derivative and then plug in x and y to it to find the 
Yeah, yep, that, so that's an implicit differentiation problem. So you're going to find dy dx. You, know, you differentiate both sides of the do algebra to get dy dx. There's probably a bit of algebra that you're going to have to do, it looks like, to, to get it. Um, uh, but then, yeah, then you'll have dy dx as a function of x and y, and you'll probably need to use both coordinates of the point they give you. Those limits are went okay. And and did no did anybody looking at part B? You know, sometimes people want to just square the top and the bottom to get rid of the radical. Did we resist that urge? It's because we're we can't just square the top and the bottom of a of a fraction. We we did uh, we did one example in class that was kind of similar. If you look through that limits, it was probably the last example in that in that section on uh, on limits that we looked at. Okay. All right. Well, um, if. Uh, if there are, are not uh, any other questions, and we'll go ahead and start uh, chapter three. The exercises from just these first two, the rest of chapter three were, you know, the exercises come from the Larson text. Uh, for chapter three, though, uh, these problems come from a different book, and um, I think, I think, oh, you know what? Uh, I don't, okay. Um, I have not posted them yet. It just says handout and posted to Canvas, but they're not actually there. Um, once later today, when you if you go to Canvas and you go to the the click on today's link for the or the link for today's page, um, here right below where it says handout posted to Canvas, you'll see an actual PDF that's posted, um, and you can you can see the problems there. Um, okay. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna start with I think a familiar type of problem. We're gonna find tangent and normal lines. Now tangent lines are very familiar to us, right? The slope of a tangent line was our motivating question that helped us figure out what this derivative is all about, right? Um, so rather than just we're not gonna stop at the slope, we're gonna actually find the whole line, the whole the, the equation of the line itself. Um, and uh, so just as a, as a quick example to start us off, we'll find the equation of a tangent line. And then I'll talk a bit about normal lines in a second. But um, if we want the equation of a line, first of all, we need a point and a slope, right? As long as I have a point and a slope, I can get the equation of a line. Um, some of these problems give you, um, you'll always be given the curve, right? You'll always be given the, the function. So in this case, it's y equals x squared minus 1. Um, and then sometimes they give you a point and ask you to find the equation of the line that's tangent or normal at that point, like we're doing here. And this is a pretty straightforward type of example. They gave us the point, so we're going to use calculus to find the slope. Um, if uh, y is equal to x squared minus 1, then dy dx is equal to 2x. I'm finding the derivative, of course, because that's what's going to tell me the tangent slope. right? So um, m tan. And let's see, we're interested in what's going on at the point negative 2, 3. So I'm going to plug in x equals negative 2, which is negative 4. So look, I've got a slope. I've got the point. Now we'll find the equation of the line. And I, I'm a big fan of the y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1, that point slope form. Uh, but you, you know, some people use slope intercept form and then do some algebra to find the intercept. I usually start here because uh, I have everything I need to plug in. So we got y minus 3 equals negative 4 times x plus 2. Now, if they don't say what form to put it in, it's OK to leave it in this form. Um, I'm going to go ahead and solve it for y to get it in slope intercept form. Negative 
4x minus 8, and then we'll add 3 to both sides, so we get y equals negative 4x minus 5. So either is fine. Um, I have a feeling if you're if you're doing the exercises and checking the answers, um, they'll probably put it in either slope-intercept form or maybe that general form. So we're kind of doing like the same type of problems we were way back, you know, when we were first exploring what the derivative is, only we're not stopping at the slope. We're actually going ahead and finding the whole equation of the line. Um, now, they will also ask, some of these problems will ask you to find the equation of a normal line. And a line that's normal to a curve is just perpendicular to the tangent line at that point. So I'm just going to, like, kind of sketch something out here, like, uh, just, um, like, if this is a curve, let's say I'm interested in what's going on right here. Here's the tangent line. The normal line is perpendicular to the tangent line. Uh, we use the word normal when we're talking about a line being normal to a curve. Perpendicular, we talk about lines being perpendicular to a line. We talk about a line being normal to a curve, and it just means perpendicular to the tangent. So this is normal. This is tangent. So if we want the equation of a normal line, we start out the same way. You know, we're still going to find the derivative. In fact, if I'm trying to find the normal slope, the first thing I do is find the tangent slope, and then I just take the opposite reciprocal to get the perpendicular slope to that. Um, so let's do another problem here on the next page. Uh, they are asking us to find the equation of the line normal to this ellipse, 4x squared plus 9y squared equals 40. They've provided us with a nice sketch at the point 1, 2. So that's like right here. And it looks like they've drawn that normal line for us. We're going to expect to get a positive slope, looks like. Um, we have the point. They gave us the point. So we have to use calculus to find the slope. I'm going to start with the equation. And uh, and then find the derivative. Uh, who wants to start us off in, in this differentiation process? Plus 18y times 0. Great. Perfect. And now we can um, solve for dy dx, right? Do some algebra. 18y dy dx is negative 8x. And then we just divide by 18y and do some reducing. So we get negative 4x over 9y. So there's dy dx. Now I want the normal line, but the first thing I'm, or uh, yeah, I want the normal line. The first thing I'm going to do though is find the tangent slope, and then I can, then I'll get the normal slope from there. So m tan is, I'm going to take dy dx and evaluate it at the point 1, 2. So that's negative 4 times 1 over 9 times 2. We could do some reducing here. Negative 2 ninths is m tan. And now the normal slope, um, so the way I indicate a normal slope is I, I write m, and then as a little subscript, that like little perpendicular, like upside down t, that's usually what I use to indicate a normal slope. Um, What's the normal slope? Nine halves. Yep. Yeah. And it's a positive nine halves. That's a, it's a positive slope. That seems to jive with what that, that line looks like anyway. So we've, we've used calculus. 
to get our slope, right? With the calculus has done its job. Now we just have to finish this up by getting the equation of the line. So y minus 2 is 9 halves x minus 1. We could leave it here or do some algebra. 9 halves x minus 9 halves. Um, 9 halves x. See, if I add 2, that's I'm adding 4 halves, so that's minus 5 halves. And either is fine. So these first two, you know, these first two um, examples kind of illustrate one type of question that we get in this section. So the the questions in this section come in two varieties. You're all for, you're always given the curve, right? They always tell you what curve you're interested in. Um, they'll always tell you that you want a line that's either tangent or normal, right? They'll tell you the curve, tangent or normal. But then in these two, they gave us the point, and we needed to use calculus to find the slope. The next example illustrates the other kind of question that we get. Um, in example 3.3, three, they say find the equation of the line that has a slope of 4 and is normal to this curve, 1 half x to the fourth plus 1. So they're telling us the normal slope, right? And we're going to use um, calculus to help us figure out what the point is, right? What, what point on the curve we're interested in. So has a slope of 4 and is normal. They're telling us that the normal slope is 4. And that means they're telling us that, that at whatever point that we're interested in, we know, the, we know the value of dy dx. What is dy dx at the point that we're interested in? Yeah, negative 1 fourth, right, opposite reciprocal. So we know the value of dy dx, so we're going to use calculus, right? We need to find dy dx um, and then figure out where it's equal to negative 1 fourth. So if y is uh, 1 half x to the fourth plus 1, what's dy dx? Two x to the third. Great. Um, and so now we know that dy dx is equal to negative one fourth. We want to figure out where that happens. So I'm just going to take two x cubed, set it equal to negative one fourth. This will tell me what x value uh, this happens. So if we divide by two, we get x cubed is negative one eighth. And then we need to take the cube root. What's the cube root of negative 1 eighth? <coughs> negative 1 half, yeah. So I know the x coordinate. How do I get the y coordinate? Plug it into the original equation of y equals one half. Yeah. Great. Good. Yeah, because it's a y coordinate we want, not a y prime coordinate. Right, so sometimes people will mistakenly plug this value back into the derivative, but it's actually we want to use the original curve. So y is one half times negative a half to the fourth plus one. So negative a half to the fourth is a positive one over sixteen. Take half of that, that's one over thirty-two plus one, which is thirty-two over thirty-two, and we get thirty-three over thirty-two. So our point is negative a half, 33 over 32. 
All right, so the calculus has done its job. Now we just want to finish the problem and uh, get the equation of the line. So y minus 33 over 32. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, y minus 33 over 32 is equal to, what's our slope? Four, yeah, x plus one half. Uh, we could leave it in this form, or you know, get it, get it in slope intercept form. So this is four x plus two, and then add thirty three over thirty two. So two is sixty four over thirty two. So if I add 33 over 32, I get 97 over 32. <laughs> Um, questions on uh, on any of these examples? Okay. Now um, we're we're not going to be able to make much progress in the next section with the time we have left, but we can set a, like a good kind of overview of what we're doing, and I want to spend some time doing that. Um, you know, when uh, somebody asked about problem five on the um, problem set, and it was the one about the train moving along the tracks and, you know, gave us a displacement function. That type of motion is called rectilinear motion. It's just motion along one direct, you know, you can go forwards or backwards and that's it. And we're going to look at curvilinear motion in this section. Um, we're allowing motion through two dimensions. And if something's moving along in two dimensions, right, like let's say something is, this is like maybe what the path looks like, right? Um, then its velocity at any given time is not just, you know, is not just how fast it's going, but also includes a direction. Velocity is what we call a vector quantity. It has both magnitude and direction. So like if it's moving along in like, this direction, right, from left to right. You know, maybe I look at what's going on right here, and its velocity is not just how fast it's going, but also the direction. So I think of, you know, velo vectors start at the origin, and it has some direction, which we call theta. It's, it's an angle measured from the positive x-axis. And then its magnitude is just the length. So something's not just going at 20 meters per second, maybe it's going at 20 meters per second at 15 degrees north of east, right? We're, we have that added information. Um, so in some of the problems that we'll do, um, we'll be given what we call parametric equations where um, where they won't just tell us like what y is as a function of x. Right, like when, if I have y as a function of x and I graph it, certainly that tells me what the path looks like, but it doesn't tell me when it hit. It doesn't tell me the direction it was going in. You know, is it going from left to right or, or right to left? Um, so sometimes they'll parametrize these equations. Um, and, and what that means is they'll give like an equation, they'll give you a pair of equations. And they'll say, here's my x equation as a function of t and my y equation as a function of t. So that if I wanted to graph it, I could just take a bunch of different values of t, plug them into the x and y, and then I get a bunch of different x, you know, uh, a bunch of different coordinates that I could kind of plot. And that, that kind of introduces time into, uh, into these problems. And we'll talk more about the parametric equations and how we use them later, but what I want to do now is just talk about vectors. Um, if anybody has taken physics, you might have seen vectors, and if you haven't, that's fine. We're going to cover everything we need to know. 
um, about vectors here. So a vector just has magnitude and direction. Um, we always think of vectors as starting at the origin. Um, the, the magnitude is just the length of the vector. The direction is this angle theta. I've drawn this vector in the first quadrant, but vectors can exist in any quadrant. Um, now, the components of a vector are the coordinates where the vector stops, right? Um, so like at the end of this vector, I have these two components, Vx and Vy. They're just the coordinates of the point. And if we're looking at um, the plane, we do one of our favorite things, which is just drop down a perpendicular. The x component, right, the x coordinate where this at the end of that vector is going to be equal to this length here. And the y component, that y coordinate at the end of that vector is equal to that length here. So now we see that we have a right triangle whose legs are the two components, Vx and Vy. And now it makes sense. If I can find those two components, then I can get my magnitude, because the magnitude is the hypotenuse, and I can use Pythagoras right, to get the magnitude. Um, if I have the components of a vector, I can also find um, I can also find the angle theta because using SOHCAHTOA, and in particular, the TOA part of SOHCAHTOA, we know that tangent of theta is Vy over Vx, opposite over adjacent. So if I know the value of tan theta, we get theta by taking arctan. Now what I've written here is theta ref. Like, that's a reference angle. Um, the arctan function, I think we talked about this uh, when we were doing, like, in inclination of a line uh, back in the first chapter. But the arctan function is limited. It will never give you an angle in the second or third quadrant. And if it gives you an angle in the fourth quadrant, it'll express it as a negative acute angle, right? But arctan is really good at giving you a first quadrant angle. So what we do is, is we say, no matter where my vector is, even if it's in the second or third or fourth quadrant, I'm going to find the first quadrant angle. I'm going to pretend it's in the first quadrant. The way I pretend it's in the first quadrant is to plug in positives, right? So no matter what I get for components of that vector, I'm going to plug in positives to arctan. That is guaranteed to give you a first quadrant angle. And then we can make adjustments based on what quadrant our vector is in. So if, um, if our vector is actually in the first quadrant, then the reference angle is our angle, right? Theta is equal to theta ref. If our vector is in the second quadrant, I'm gonna I'm gonna sketch something. Um, actually, I think maybe I could do it right here. All right, so here's my first quadrant. There's theta theta ref. And if, if that vector is actually in the first quadrant, then theta ref is our theta. If my vector is in the second quadrant, then when we say pretend everything's positive and get that reference angle, all we've done is sort of flip it over the y-axis. Right? There's symmetry here. So that value of theta ref is equal to this value right there, is equal to that angle. And what I want as a second quadrant angle is this guy right here. And the way I get it, is I take 180 and I subtract the reference angle. If my vector is in the third quadrant, then the reference angle is equal to that uh, angle there, hanging down below the negative x-axis. 
And so the angle that we want, we're going to find by taking 180 and adding the reference angle. And then finally, if we're in the fourth quadrant, um, that reference angle is the angle hanging down below the positive x-axis. So theta is 360 minus the reference angle. So we, this is just our, our technique for how we overcome the shortcomings of the arctan function. But arctan is really good at the first quadrant angles, so we'll make arctan give us a first quadrant angle. Then we can make whatever adjustments we need to, to make. I think in most of the problems, the vectors we find end up being in the first quadrant anyway, um, but there would probably be a couple in the exercises where we run into um, vectors in, in other quadrants. Um, now, the, the way that calculus ends up being a part of this, um, calculus is how we actually get those components. So for the most part, when we're looking for these vectors, what we're going to start off doing is saying, okay, can I find these components, right? Can I figure out the coordinates where the vector ends? And if we imagine, um, I'm going to scroll down here just to look at this figure. So imagine that this parabola that we're looking at is like a path that some object is traveling on. And we take a snapshot right here, so we have this vector V. Vx is, you know, part of that motion is, is horizontal and part of that motion is vertical, right? As it's moving along the curve, it's moving part sideways and part upward. And the part that, that's moving sideways, that's our x component. The part that is moving upwards, that, that part is our y component of the, um, of the velocity vector. And the x component is how fast the x is changing. It is the derivative of x with respect to time. And the y component is how fast the y is changing. It is the derivative of y with respect to time. So this is where calculus comes in to these curvilinear motion problems. We're going to, uh, the, the, your x and y components are defined to be the derivatives of x and y with respect to time. So. Um, I think we have time to do one example, um, and uh, and that'll kind of help, I think, solidify some of the things we've been talking about with vectors here, um, and also give us a chance to um, uh, look at uh, parametric equations. So on the next page, they say an object is moving by the parametric equations x equals 3t squared and y equals 1 minus t squared. So they didn't tell us like the rectangular equation. They didn't say y is a function of x. But what they did tell us is how we get x and y individually once I know time. Um, as it turns out, our calculators can graph these. Um, in the calculator, there's a parametric mode uh, where the calculator is going to expect a pair of equations. Uh, to plug in, and then you just tell it, okay, plug in a bunch of values of t and like show me what this curve looks like. Um, and let's see what this looks like here. So what I'm going to do is put this in parametric mode. It's in our, your function, uh, your calculator is probably in function mode. That's sort of the default. But I'm, I'm going to hit mode. I'm going to arrow down to where it says function, and then use my arrow to highlight parametric. Depending on the model, it might spell out parametric or it might just say par. But you hit enter there. Now once it's in parametric mode, hit the y equals, and now it looks different. Oh, I've got some stuff. So it looks different. It is, um, it's expecting a pair of equations. We have x1, t, y1, t. And here's the other cool thing. Let's, so let's say I put in the x equals 3t squared. Um, when I hit the variable button, it knows since it's in parametric mode that our variable is t. So I have 3t squared. The y is 1 minus t squared. Now if we hit window, right, because I want to kind of set the window, um, 
it's going to need some more information and not just X and Y. It obviously is going to ask you X and Y, like how far, you know, what your axes should be. But it starts out with T-min and T-max and T-step. So where does time begin? And I guess it makes sense to begin at zero. Um, where does, what's the maximum time? And what's the T-step? Like how often do you want it to stop and calculate coordinates and plot a point? So the smaller the value for T-step, the longer it'll take to graph, but also you'll get a smoother curve. So here I put it at 1 100th. Um, I'm going to just, let's see, my, my, um, my X and Y axes, I guess I'll just, I'll start with the standard minus 10 to 10. I'm not really sure what this actually looks like, so. And I'll leave the T, uh, the T min and max going from 0 to 10 and the T step at 1 100th. Let's see what this does. If now if I hit graph, oh, it's like, it kind of looks like a line. <laughs> I, I don't, as it turns out, I don't need uh, X to be negative. So maybe I'll let X start at zero. But it looks something like that. It looks pretty linear, actually. So what we want um, is to find the uh, um, is to find the velocity when uh, t is equal to two seconds. So um, so we know what this path looks like. Now the way that we use calculus is I'm going to need to find if I'm looking for a velocity vector, I first want the components. So I'm going to take my equations, x equals 3t squared, and y equals 1 minus t squared. I'm going to differentiate each with respect to t. So dx dt is 6t. dy dt is negative 2t. If I want the components, the vx and the vy, now I'm just going to evaluate each of these at t equals 2. So vx is 6 times 2, or 12. vy is negative 2 times 2, or negative 4. I have my components. If I were to sketch this out, like um, not the path, but just what the vector looks like. Vectors always start at the origin. vx is uh, 12 vy is negative 4, it'd be over here. So this is in the fourth quadrant. So now the calculus has done its job. We're going to finish by getting magnitude and direction. The magnitude of a vector, we use Pythagoras, so the square root of the sum of the squares. Twelve point six five approximately. Now, in the with vectors, it's the magnitude that gets the um, units. So the magnitude, they told us that uh, distances are in centimeters and time is in seconds, so this would be centimeters per second. And now we're going to find the reference angle first. We get reference, excuse me, we get the reference angle by taking arctan of positive vy over positive vx. So arctan of 3 Oh whoops, I just reversed that. Uh vy was negative 4, so that should be 4 over 12, not 12 over 4. So that's one third. Uh so we get oh 
I get 0.3217, I'd be like, wow, that's a really small uh, angle. Seems like the angle should be bigger. Um, I got such a small number because my calculator is in radian mode, so I'm going to switch that up. Eighteen point four degrees. So that eighteen point four degrees, that's the measure of this angle here. That's how far down below the positive x axis is. So um, our angle that we're looking for, theta, is one eighty minus eighteen point four. And I get one sixty one point six. So now we put these two things together. We have the magnitude, we have the direction. Now the way we state our result is we say the velocity is 12.65 centimeters per second at an angle of 161.6 degrees. It's pretty common to use this like kind of angle opening and write the angle in there. Or some people write 12.65 centimeters per second at 161.6 degrees. I mean, as long as you're sort of saying this pair of values, that's what defines my vector. Should it be 360 degrees into the quadrant four? Oh, ha, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, 160, uh, that's not in quadrant four. Let, let me fix that. Three forty one point six. There we go. How's that? Okay. Um, so, um, we're almost out of time. I just want to uh, go back. Um, we'll f we'll finish this section up um, probably on on uh, on Monday. Well, on Monday. So here's the plan for Monday. I'm gonna take as much time as you want answering questions you have, because we um, uh, because we have a test on Tuesday. In the absence of questions, we'll finish this section on curvilinear motion. Um, we have a quiz tomorrow, and that will that'll cover like chain rule, chain rule problems, implicit differentiation. I think there's just three problems. And higher derivatives. I think there's three problems. Um, any uh, any questions before we adjourn for the day? Can you just leave that up there for a few seconds so that they can write it down? Yep. Are we good? Yeah. All right, great. Um, you know, reach out if you have any questions as you're working on the problem set. Um, otherwise, you know, just enjoy the weekend, and um, and I'll see you all on Monday. <laughs>